Hello, this is Dr. Norman Thomas, and welcome to tonight's edition of Power Talk. Really looking forward to this time with you. We'll be right back. Now, you can help us serve our local community and bridge the gap of food insecurities among families right here at home. New Life is currently receiving canned good food items only. Your donations of canned food items will make a difference for so many families affected by the 2020 hurricanes and COVID-19. Learn ways in which you can help today. Call or text us at 337-433-1111 or visit us online at nlcinternational.org and click on Food Bank. Giving is simple and secure. If you'd like to give, just text the word GIVE to our giving number and tap the link. From here, you can give any amount you'd like. Choose what you give to and make it a one-time or recurring gift. It's that simple. For your first time, you'll need to register to complete your gift. After that, you can give again, anytime, anywhere. Just text the word GIVE. I was reflecting earlier in the week uh, on the joy of giving uh, with Dr. Debbie. We were just talking about the opportunities that we've had to be a blessing to our community, to the world at large, and to individuals, to people. And how exciting that is when you are in a position to bless and to, and to be a blessing to others. Many times we think we have to have a whole lot to be a blessing, but you don't. You just start with what you have. You begin the process, and it's really about believing what the Bible says about increase and how the kingdom is designed to increase you and to increase your ability to be a blessing to others. But there's something about the joy of giving and the cheerfulness in the act of giving. It's a delight. To give. Now, that only happens to you when you have a revelation of giving. When you have a revelation of giving, it is a delight to give. It blesses you when you're in a position to do so. And I keep saying when you're in a position, but we're all in a position to do so in some degree or another. So not to ask to not make excuse for not giving and not participate, participating in generosity. So when you take the opportunity tonight to consider your giving, please know that as you saw in the food bank commercial, you're helping people as we did this a uh, couple of weekends ago out here on this campus. And as we will do again on Mother's Day weekend, namely that Saturday, we're going to be out here from nine to one and we're going to be giving people food. We're going to bless them with hot food and we're going to bless them with canned goods and dry goods as well. But the Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says in verse number 7, every man according as he purposes in his heart, or every person, as they purpose in their heart, so let them give. And it goes on, not grudgingly or of necessity. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. God didn't love you having to give out of obligation, he, he, don't, he, don't, he don't want that. The Amplified Bible says, let each one give as he or she has made up their own mind and purposed in their heart. And you're going to do that based on the word of God and based on the spirit of God within you. And he says, not reluctantly, not sorrowfully, not under compulsion, for God loves, God takes pleasure in, and he prizes above other things, and he is unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt-to-do-it giver whose heart is in his giving. Father, we thank you tonight for giving, the opportunity to give, the joy of giving, and the cheerfulness of heart in our giving. We thank you for the fact that you have created and set up the system of your kingdom around the concept of sowing seed and reaping harvest. Well, we declare our seed is blessed tonight. 
We declare that it comes back to us in a great harvest so that we may expand and grow in our generosity and in our living. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be right back. Dreaming is one of the most important things that you can do in your life. You were actually born for it. You were designed by God to dream because it engages the imagination. God gave you that imagination so that you could literally see what he says. God has big, big plans for you. He's got big things that he desires for you to do. But nothing can come to you except it first comes through you. So don't let anything and don't let anybody stop you from dreaming. Dream big and dream big on purpose. In the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 15, verse 58, is our foundational text. And it goes like this. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm or be steadfast, be immovable, be always abounding in the work of the Lord, always being superior, excelling, doing more than enough in the service of the Lord, knowing and being continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile. It is never wasted or to no purpose." Notice here, he's talking about your attitude of consistency. He says, be steadfast, be immovable, be always abounding, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, the work of the Lord doesn't necessarily mean you being a preacher or a minister or in ministry. The work of the Lord can be in any area of life where God has placed you, where you have a grace or an anointing on your life to contribute to humanity, contribute to the good of mankind. Well, that is the work of the Lord. It, it, he put that gift inside of you. And so you releasing that gift, expressing that gift to those around you is the work of the Lord. He wants you to, know, to abound in the work of the Lord, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That means always increasing and always growing and always developing in that work. I want to read to you our foundational uh, scripture here. No, not foundational scripture, our opening paragraph that we have used each week, basically. It says, consistency or steadfastness establishes you toward your success. Consistency establishes you toward your success, and this is applicable on every level of life, including your professional growth, your spiritual development, your nav uh, uh, navigating adversity, and personal development. So regardless of which of these areas you're, we're dealing with, whether you're trying to get through a situation, trying to overcome a problem, trying to rise beyond the limitations that are in your life, whether it's your pursuit of a career, whether it's your pursuit of professional development, whether it's business development, it really doesn't matter what it is. Consistency is always going to be a vital key to your success in that particular pursuit. Even if it's just simple, something like exercise, you got to be consistent. It, without consistency, you will not reap the benefits that exercise will provide you. So that's a very simple example, but it is a very true and noteworthy example. Consistency is even more important when it comes to hearing from God. Most people desire to hear from God only during a crisis, but when we establish consistent patterns of communicating with God, it will not be difficult to hear from him during times of trouble or during times of adversity. So what I mean by that statement is that we really need to just take time and develop a communication with the Father. That is something beyond what is, what is religious. You know, it's like, you know, we know how to act religious, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an everyday, uh, personable interaction with the Father. It is 
it is communicating with him on a very, very natural and authentic level. It's uh, talking with him like you would talk to uh, a best friend. It is sharing your heart with him. And then you have this next level of dialogue that's really not dialogue. It is a decreeing and a declaring of things so. It is a, uh, a calling things forth into existence. And what we're calling forth is really what he has already declared so based on his word for our life and based on his purposes and his plans for our life. So you do have a couple of levels of communication. One is, one is a, more of a, a confession, a decree, a declaring, a declaration of things. The other one is a communication and, and a dialogue, and God will just kind of lead you and prompt you in situations, uh, situations with people, situations with events, you know, or even helping you choose certain options that you may have in life. God loves being involved in our life on, on that level. Uh, even if it's about interviewing employees or partners in business, you know, if you will let God in at that table and, and let him guide you in that process, he will enlighten you to some things uh, about uh, people's situations, about uh, the, the heart of an individual that may not be toward your benefit or may be toward your benefit. In other words, it, he helps you to discern when something's good for you, when something's not good for you, when there is a pattern of communication developing between you and he. Now, when trouble comes, if you got that going on, it's not difficult to get an answer in terms of which way to turn or what to do because you're so accustomed and you're so in sync with him, uh, you're able to hear his voice at a moment's notice uh, that will help guide you around a troubled situation uh, or bypassing a situation that could have bogged you down for months or years for that matter. So God can save you time and God can save you money. He can certainly save you heartache when you develop a relationship and a pattern of consistency in communicating with him. So don't wait till a crisis. Now, if that's the best you can do, if that's the best you've done and you're in a crisis and you, the, the best thing you can do is call out to God. But what I'm saying, once you get beyond this crisis, once he helps you get past this point, now stay with him. Stay connected with him. Keep your heart uh, close to him. Keep your ear close to, to, to his voice so that you can hear continuously and make the right decisions in terms of what you're to do, how you're to proceed, how you're to, to navigate through this situation instead of just doing, quite frankly, whatever you want to do just because you think that's what you want and it feels good or it looks good or, or you just don't care, you know? And then when trouble come, you go running to God. You know, so the best scenario is to, is to develop a consistent walk with him and you won't, you won't have that, that crisis situation. We have a working definition of consistency, and I want to share that with you. It, it is steadfastness with, resolution, with resoluteness and loyalty to an idea or an assignment or a cause. Steadfastness with resoluteness and loyalty to an idea, an assignment, or a cause. Another definition is the ability to make necessary adjustments while continuing to move forward and to reach your final outcome of success. Now, I like that one a lot because a lot of times when we're going through things in life, we feel like we have to make adjustments. And sometimes when we make those adjustments, we stop progress. We stop moving forward. We, we make the adjustments, but we don't move forward. And then by the time you get moving again, and by the time you start building momentum again, you know, you've lost a lot of time and you've lost a lot of ground. So there is this place in God where you can make the necessary adjustments that you need to make while continuing to move forward. Now, you may not move with the same rate or of speed that you were moving prior to adjustments, but just keep moving. 
And then after those adjustments are made, you'll find that you will have a better flow than you did before the adjustments were made. And then finally, it is an unwavering determination to not be deterred and to not be distracted. Now, this is a level of consistency that happens to a man or a woman once the idea, once the loyalty uh, to an idea or what did I say, an idea, an assignment or cause, once that gets down into the root level of you, that's when this unwavering determination begins to kick in. That's when this, I will not be deterred, I will not be distracted, that's when that begins to kick in. And now it still all depends on you, and it depends on your attitude towards that particular thing. But once you get that, and you, you get that in your heart, into your system, you just will not be, you won't be moved. You won't be deterred and you won't be distracted. Now, tonight I want to deal specifically with the idea of abiding in God and God abiding in you. The word abide is alone by itself uh, characterized by consistency. It's the word, we use the word dwell also in this particular instance. When you dwell in the Father and the Father dwells in you, there are some outcomes that you can expect. And if you flip it, there are certain outcomes that you should not expect if you're not dwelling in him and him dwelling in you. Now, that doesn't mean that you're living a, this perfect life. It means that you have a consciousness of the presence of God within you and you are aware of his presence constantly all the time and that you're always having to reconcile that presence within you in light of the decisions you make and the choices you make in life. Doesn't mean you always make the right decision. Doesn't mean you always make the right choices. But it does mean that you always have to deal with and contend with this idea of God's presence within you while making the wrong decisions and while choosing wrong. And that's something that you allow to happen in your life. That is a yielding that you do purposefully uh, or purposely and it's, it's something that you do voluntarily. You allow yourself to be uh, convicted in a sense of when you're choosing wrong or when you're going in the wrong direction. You allow the presence of God to convict you from the inside to cause you to become aware that you're going the wrong way. You've made the wrong choice. You're doing the wrong thing. And you have the opportunity to turn this thing around. So the scripture that I have for you is John chapter 15 and verse 7. John 15 verse 7 in the Amplified Bible translation says, If you live in me, live in me, which means abide vitally united to me. That's pretty strong, isn't it? If you abide vitally united to me and my words remain in you and continue, there's consistency, continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. I don't know if you know how powerful that statement is, but Maybe we, if we just walk backwards in this scripture from the end to the beginning, because who does not want to be in a place where you can ask whatever you will and it will be done for you? Now, we understand in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, it talks about when we pray that we pray his will. We pray his will. But there's a place in God that when you are surrendered to him, his will becomes your will. And then you can literally pray your will and it is automatically his will. Why? Because you abide in him and he abides in you. 
there's a track record of consistency in your fellowship with him and his with you that you to desire a thing is to desire a thing that God desires for you. So this is a very, very powerful revelation that if we take the time to consider it, we can really change a lot of things in our lives, especially the things in our lives that we just don't like the, the outcomes that we're seeing. We don't care for certain uh, productions in our life and, and we wonder how we can change that. Well, he says, you can change it by developing a, a, a track record, a consistency where you abide in me and my words abide in you. And then you can act on that consistency by voicing what it is that you desire. And because you and God are vitally united, then what you desire will come to pass. That is a beautiful place to be in him. So my notes I have here, abiding in Christ is the ultimate of consistency in your life. It is important as a believer to diligently keep the word before us so that we may remain consistent in the quality of life he has designed for us. You see, what happens when we allow the word to be removed from our reach, meaning removed from our consciousness by not listening to the word, by not associating with the word through fellowship with people that God has placed in our lives, when we back off from those things, we lose consciousness of his presence in our lives. And sometimes people do that unintentionally, intentionally, if that makes any sense. Sometimes people back away on purpose because they don't want that, that awareness at a point, a point in their life. And maybe they're in a season of rebellion. <laughs> they just want to do what they want to do. They, 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 they feel like they've sacrificed enough and they're done with sacrificing for a while. I'll be back, God, that kind of thing. And they just do whatever they want to do for a season in their life. And, and you know, and they really in the back of their minds are, are trusting that the grace of God will activate if needed, that God will not be removed from them and that he will remain there with them uh, when needed, if they need him to be there. And he will, he will. But that doesn't erase the consequences that we face as a result of bad decisions and poor choices that we make. Uh, the, the presence of God will remain. He promised, he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So that's, that's, that's a given. You can count on God being there for you no matter what. No matter what you do, no matter how you behave, God will be there for you. However, it doesn't change the fact that you still may have to navigate and walk through certain consequences that you created as a result of your choices and your decisions. And there's even times when God's grace will be there to cover you in those moments. But, you know, the, 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 the law of seed time and harvest is across the board. It, you can't pick and choose when you want seed time and harvest to work. If you plant seed, you just can't expect to reap harvest. And if you plant the wrong seed, you can expect to reap the wrong harvest and so forth. So anyway, my point to you is it's, it's about abiding. And it's, again, God knows you're not a perfect being. He knows that you have not perfected this and that that you're not going to always get it right. You're not going to always make the right decisions, say the right things, and be in the right places at the right times 100% of the time. But your yield to him for his presence, your surrender to his presence in you, meaning your acknowledgement of his presence in your life and his word in your life to, to even to just be able to uh, announce that, man, this is wrong. This is wrong that I'm engaged in. It's absolutely wrong. Just to be able to reconcile that act with him because you have chosen to remain conscious of his presence in your life 
will eventually get you to a place to where you can reap positive and glorious outcomes in your life. You don't want to cut that off. And it goes on. My notes here says, our consistency in him and his word keeps the integrity of the word at work in every area of our lives, including in the areas of our attitudes and our beliefs. So uh, a lot of times we negate attitudes and, and, and that's a problematic because uh, the right attitudes leads to the right beliefs and the right beliefs leads to the right behavior. If you have a bad attitude, you're going to believe wrong and you're going to act wrong. You're going to, you're going to follow through with that attitude. The attitude is, is, is really kin to thought patterns and thought processes and it creates a temporary state of mind that sometimes is not good or is good depending on what it is. But my point to you is what we want to do is keep a consistent attitude of his word within us. Again, simply remaining conscious of his presence and, and inviting him constantly, even when you're not at your best, even when you're just, you're just, you're just not at your best, remaining aware of his presence in your life. Now, in Psalms 91, it says here to us, he that dwells in the secret place. Let's just for simplicity's sake say, the secret place is the presence of God. The secret place is the presence of God. He that dwells in the secret place, he that dwells in the presence of God shall abide under the shadow of of the Almighty. Now, dwell, abide, dwell, abide. These all speak to consistency. Uh, a person who dwells in a place doesn't just pick up and leave here every, every two or three days. They dwell there. If they go, it's temporarily. They come back. To abide in a place is to belong in a place, is to be in a place. And so, again, we're talking about the protection side of God uh, abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. That's protection. That's defense, and that's protection. Well, defense and protection comes as a result of dwelling, dwelling in the secret place. So let's read my notes. Dwelling in his presence keeps us safe from inconsistencies in life. We remain unwavering and unchanged. Dwelling in his presence keeps us safe from the inconsistencies in life. Can you agree with me that there is nothing guaranteed in the world system, the world's way of doing things? You can't rest on that. You can't say, oh, that'll be right there tomorrow. No, you just don't know what's going to happen from day to day in this world. But in God, it doesn't matter what happens every day or from day to day in this world because you have a thread of consistency in your fellowship with him. And you can be sure of this one thing, that God is there and that God is with you and that he's guiding you, and that he's leading you and he, his presence is there with you. And with that, you will have the wisdom that you need to navigate the hills, the mountains, the valleys, and everything else the world throws at you, you can manage life successfully if you stay aware of his presence within you, regardless of what's happening. The temptation to be altered comes when we yield ourselves to variations of doctrine and inconsistencies regarding the word that leads to inconsistencies in life. So let me just say this. Let me simplify that statement. The objective of the world's inconsistencies in your life is authored and orchestrated by the enemy. The objective of this is to throw you off and to pull you away from the word of God, is to give you ideas and thoughts that are not uh, complementary to God's ideas and God's thoughts about that thing that's happening in your life. So what you want to do is make sure, just like, uh, just like medicine, you take 
medicine. You know, medicine is not the most favorite thing for people to ingest, but yeah, we know that certain medicines serve us well when we take them uh, according to instruction and, and we feel better or we uh, experience better outcomes. Uh, it, you know, just depends on what it is. Well, the word, the Bible says the word is medicine. The word is medicine. And so you, you, you don't receive the word just because you're oh, so excited to receive the word. You know, now that's true. There, I'm telling you, more times I'm more excited to receive the word than I'm not. But there are times I receive the word because I know I need the word, not because I'm just, just happy, happy, ready to, to eat the word. Most of the time, yes, I am. But then there are times I'm not. It just depends on what's happening and what's going on and what you're dealing with and what you're processing and how you're nav navigating in life. And you know that word is necessary for you whether you feel like receiving it or not. So even when you don't feel like receiving the word, because people, sometimes they experience that, well, you still receive it. You know, you don't always feel like eating, but you still do. You know, there are things you don't always feel like doing, but I hope you continue to, you know, to shower and to bathe, even though you don't feel like it. You know you still need to do that, right? So... Spiritual hygiene, spiritual welfare, spiritual growth and spiritual development. You don't always feel like getting up and going to work or going to your place of business every day. You don't feel like doing that whenever you do, always. But you know it's necessary. Same thing with the Word of God. Now, when you get into this Word, uh, it just kind of it, it takes over your spirit. And it, it becomes a joy to, to process the word and receive the word and fellowship daily in the word of God. And, you know, you'll find yourself going to parts of the Bible that the Holy Spirit leads you to, to enlighten you about certain things that you think have nothing to do with your life. And it's, it's totally re re relevant to your life. So anyway, my point is, let's get back to the. <laughs> my point is, is that, the temptation to be altered. Sometimes people just want something different for the sake of having something different when something different is not always what they need. When something new is not always the needful thing. Sometimes you need what you've been getting and you need to be more consistent in that and stop appeasing your flesh with something new, with something fresh, just because you want to feel something different. It's not about what you need to feel. It's, it's what you need for growth and for development in your life. And the Holy Spirit will minister that, minister that to you. Let me read this scripture to you and then uh, we'll move on. This is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. That's, it's a few scriptures. So let's just, just follow along with me. By the way, these notes are available to you on our website. They're always available. If you go to... Uh, the information will be on the screen. Uh, it's info at uh, nlcinternational.org. It's on the screen. Uh, I hope they put it on the screen for you. You can go to the media page and download this or print it. Anyway, Ephesians 4, 17. So I tell you this. This is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. He says, I tell you this, and I insist, I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now, the Gentiles were the unbelievers. He says, don't live like unbelievers uh, in the futility of their thinking. He says, they are darkened in their understanding. And because of that, they are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of the hearts. When we move away from the word, our hearts goes through this process of becoming hardened. A hardened heart is a heart that is not sensitive to the things of God as it was before. Now, this is not something that happens instantly. This is something that happens over time, usually over a long period of time, like a year or two. The enemy is very crafty in moving you away, causing your ideas to change 
very, very so slowly, but so, so truly over time that before you know it, you have really turned in an entirely different direction without even feeling the change. And he does this by suggesting ideas and suggesting thoughts to you over time. He says, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. You, uh, when you heard about Christ, you didn't learn that when you heard about Christ and when you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and made new in the attitudes of your minds to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and, and holiness. So there's safety and protection found in your consistency with God. So, you know, over time, uh, when you step away from the word, when you step away from consciousness of the presence of God in you, you begin to accept and you begin to tolerate things that you, you wouldn't before. And now you have a new idea about it. You have a new attitude about it. You know, this is okay. This is not bad. I'm not hurting anybody. You know, this, you know, you know. And little by little, slowly by slowly, you begin to uh, loosen your grip on spiritual matters. Uh, bef and before long, you're in total disagreement with what you believed before. So all I'm saying is, is that the word will help you remain consistent, not adhering to rules and regulations and, and being so hard-lined about life and I can't do that, I can't do this. It's not about that. It is about staying pure in heart towards yourself. It is about staying pure in heart towards God, letting God speak to you. There are things, even Paul writes about this. He says, this may be right for you, but it's not right for this person. You know, uh, and, and there are reasons for these things. And, and so, and it's not about you looking at somebody else and comparing your life with theirs and judging them and all that kind of stuff. It is about what is God saying to you? Not what he said to somebody else and you do what they do. What is he saying to you? How is he ministering to you? And you following that and not using that either as an excuse to be liberal in your thoughts and liberal in your ideas to do whatever you want to do, but to stay aligned with him and to stay in union with him, making sure that, that there is a calibration of his presence within you and you following that as you're hearing from him and being led by him and being guided by him that you reconcile uh, your life that way. Now, whenever you are confronted with a change in your life, if you're endeavoring to stay united with God, the Holy Spirit will raise that issue up in you, in your mind and in your heart, and evaluate it, and determine it for you. And all you got to do is yield to what he has determined and what he has evaluated and just follow suit. Now, if you start questioning it and you start splitting hairs with it so that you can end up ultimately doing what it is that you want to do, now, you know, you know he'll back off. He'll just simply back off. He'll just let you, let you carry on. Uh, but... If you are yielded, he will lead you. He'll guide you and say, no, you shouldn't do that. He says, yes, go there. It's okay. You can go there. I'm with you. He'll say, you know, and he, no, that's, no, that's enough. <laughs> I think you get the point, all right? Now, let's look at a practical application. Now, tonight, I want to look at a practical application that can speak to our lives in terms of uh, how we can practically apply this level of consistency. I'm going to use Paul, and I'm going to use Silas. And this is an incident found in the book of Acts, in this chapter 16 of Acts, 
where this woman was following Paul and Silas, and uh, she was following behind them, and she was parading in, with these words and these declarations saying, these men are the men of the Most High God that show us the way of salvation. Now, she was saying the right thing, but Paul discerned that this was a spirit of distraction. This was a spirit of the enemy that was trying to draw attention away from the word and towards this distraction that was being uh, carried on. This was designed to move people's eye from what they needed to hear and see to what she was doing. Even though she was saying the right thing, it was coming from a dark spirit. And Paul saw it, and he discerned it, and he recognized it, and the Bible says that he spoke to that dark spirit and commanded that that spirit depart from this woman, and immediately it did. Now, the problem that Paul had... Uh, produced for himself by doing this wonderful act was that this woman was also being used by some of the businessmen and wealthy men of, the, of that town and city. She was a fortune teller. She was, uh, uh, she was by the same dark spirit uh, speaking uh, uh, people's future and so forth, uh, divination. And they were using her to make money. And they were obviously making quite a bit of money off of this, this uh, demonic activity. But when Paul spoke to that spirit and it left her, they were out of business. This became a big problem because now Paul has, uh, <laughs> he has interfered with the economic uh, uh, success of these men and now they were upset and now they wanted to see him imprisoned because of his activity they reported him and they they brought him to court and they they tried him and they were sentenced paul and silas both were sentenced to prison not only were they sentenced to prison they were sentenced into the the what we would call probably what do you call that cell block or the inner courts of the prison and now the the, the secure area within the secure area and they were also chained with, by their hands, their wrists, and their ankles were chained uh, to the, the walls of the prison. Not only that, before all of that, they were whipped, they were beaten, they, were, they, they were, had been given many stripes. And so now they are wounded and they are bound to the walls of the prison. And Paul and Silas, the Bible says, begin to pray and they begin to sing. Now, whew, that right there is the perfect picture of consistency. It's like, not only can I sing and pray when things are going well, when things are in my favor, but I can also praise God and I can also pray to my Father when things don't look good. I can also render thanksgiving to Him when it appears that I have nothing to be thankful for. That's consistency. And that's what Paul and Silas did. Now I want to read the scripture that I pulled uh, that is on your handout. It's verses uh, Acts 16, 25 and 26. And it says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. Now remember, these guys were beaten. They didn't, I mean, they were bound, so they couldn't even attend to themselves. You know how you like to just kind of just kind of soothe your own wound? They couldn't even do that. And, 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 and so one of them came up and said, hey, man, let's just pray. They began to pray. The other one, maybe, or the same ones, let's sing. And they agreed, and they began to sing. They didn't sing songs of sorrow and misery. They sang praises, the Bible says, praises to God and the prisoners heard them so they weren't mumbling and they weren't doing it quietly they were doing it out loud and all the other prisoners heard them and after a while of praying and singing something supernatural happened we call it breakthrough it was literally a breakout <laughs> but we call it breakthrough now I'm here to tell you 
that consistency will create a breakthrough in your life. It will. Consistency in the right thing will produce a breakthrough of the right outcomes for your life. At midnight, they prayed, they sang, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. Now, the earthquake don't seem like something that's designed to give you breakthrough, right? It looks bad, but it's good. Now, so you got to be discerning. You got to be able to see when your victory is about to come. You can't look at something and say, man, that's horrible. No, that's your victory. Your victory is, is on the verge of coming towards you because you've remained consistent. So even the earthquake looked terrible. It looked horrible. Man, we're in prison. We're bound to the walls. We can't even run out of here. And now you're talking about an earthquake? That seems horrible. But no, it was the key. It was the, it was the entry point of their breakthrough. So the earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were open. Did you hear that? All the doors of the prison were open. All the doors of the prisons of the prison were open and everybody's bands were loose. Everybody's bands were, so they were free at the wrist. They were free at the ankle. All the doors were open. Well, what do you think? It's time to go, right? So, Paul and Silas remain consistent. Now, let me share this part with you. You think, hey, the doors are open. I'm, I'm unfeathered. I'm unbound. Let's get out of here. They didn't do that because they knew that the life of that guard, the, the, the warden, was at risk because if, you know, all the prisoners escaped, then the warden would be destined to, to die. Well, Paul made sure that he didn't harm himself at the, at the idea of being frightened that he would be killed, and he announced that everybody was still there. They ministered to that man. They didn't just run, all, run away. So even, look, in your breakthrough, you're going to help other people, other people will be made free as a result of you being made free. Other people will experience victory as a result of your victory. So don't just take your victory and run. Be aware that your victory empowers you to minister life to someone else to bring them into their victory. God has walked you through this process so that you can reach out and bring someone else through the process too. You know, some of you listening to me right now or at, whenever you're watching this, maybe after it's run live perhaps even, you are empowered to help somebody reach the level of victory that you have right now. In other words, you can bring somebody up to the exact same level you right now are experiencing. You have the power to do that. And not only do you have the power to do it, God has already spoken to you to whom you're supposed to minister that to. That's so liberating and it's so wonderful to be in that particular place where you have an assignment from God to bring somebody up to your level. That's powerful. And I'm encouraging you right now, whoever you are, to do that and to make that happen because that is your assignment. Paul and Silas remain consistent in their attitude, even in the most difficult situation. And remaining consistent is also to remain faithful to what we know. What did Paul and Silas know? You know, they, they could have meditated on what they didn't know. What, what, what's going to happen? You know, when they're going to come get us and how are we going to die? All that. None of that which they knew. But they did know how to pray, and they did know how to praise God. They stuck with what they knew, and the outcomes that Paul and Silas received, their breakthrough was guaranteed and will be guaranteed in your life when you remain consistent 
in an attitude of faith regarding your situation or your adversity. This is a great time even now in life where we're faced with all kinds of challenges in the world and in our lives. But to be consistent, to be consistent, to pick up and, and pledge to yourself and to God, I will remain consistent in the things of God. I will not back off praying. I will not back off praising. I will not back off uh, giving. I will not back off loving. I will not back off receiving the word of God. I'm going to be consistent. Your consistency is going to bring your breakthrough if you just stick with it. And if you don't give up, don't cave in, don't burn out, don't, don't, <laughs> don't pass out, just stay with it. Just, and, and just keep your heart close to God, keep your ear close to him and just stay with what he tells you to do, it's going to be all right. You're going to be good. You're going to be better than good. You're going to be better than before. Until next time, it's been a pleasure being with you. On behalf of myself, Dr. Debbie, keep walking by faith. Now you can help us serve our local community and bridge the gap of food insecurities among families right here at home. New Life is currently receiving canned good food items only. Your donations of canned food items will make a difference for so many families affected by the 2020 hurricanes and COVID-19. Learn ways in which you can help today. Call or text us at 337-433-1111 or visit us online at nlcinternational.org and click on Food Bank. is simple and secure. If you'd like to give, just text the word GIVE to our giving number and tap the link. From here, you can give any amount you'd like. Choose what you give to and make it a one-time or recurring gift. It's that simple. For your first time, you'll need to register to complete your gift. After that, you can give again, anytime, anywhere. Just text the word GIVE.